Welcome to worship on this 20th Sunday after the Pentecost. I'm glad that uh, you are all here this morning and uh, grateful for um, the opportunities that we have to worship in different manners, in different places, and, and in different times and in different ways. So I hope that um, you all are settled in and uh, looking forward to worship today. Next week is Reformation Sunday, um, and um, you know, we're all going to miss our Bratfest. I know that. Uh, a lot of folks have put a lot of time and energy into that over the years. It was kind of a big fellowship event for us. But I think we need to still celebrate Reformation Sunday as, uh, um, as Reformation was originally celebrated, and that is celebrating the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, the freedom that we have to make choices, the freedom that we have uh, to choose to live into God's vision for the world which is a vision of justice and mercy and humility. So we will celebrate that. I hope you all wear red. If you're worshiping at home, put on your best red robe. If you're coming to church, come on in and uh, bring, wear something red. We'd love to see you be a part of that. I want to give a little credit today to a colleague of mine, Debbie Thomas, uh, who shares a lectionary essay every week on a website called Journey with Jesus. I just want you to know that her insights really informed my preaching today. Um, So, Debbie Thomas, thanks to you out there. In 2019, Christ the Lord Lutheran Church donated just over $99,000, 21% of your gifts to benevolent causes, to support our mission partners. Of that $99,000, the largest single portion was given in support of the ELCA through the Grand Canyon Synod, a little more than $49,000. The Reverend Deborah Hutter, Bishop of the Grand Canyon Synod of the ELCA, would like you to know what we accomplished with those funds. So I ask that you would please hear her word of thanksgiving for our partnership. Hello, Christ the Lord. I'm Deborah Hutterer, and I get to serve as the Bishop of the Grand Canyon Synod, and I get to say thank you to you. The word synod means to walk together, and that is just what your contributions to the Grand Canyon Synod allow us to do. Because of you, more than $800,000 a year is sent to support the work of ELCA ministries across this country and the globe. Your offerings help to fund programs like Young Adults in Global Mission, seminaries, seven seminaries, mission developers, Lutheran World Federation, disaster response, and world hunger. In addition, your gifts added to the others mean that we invest about $400,000 in ministries in and around our synod, like four Lutheran campus ministries, Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary, Cal Lutheran, Arizona Faith Network, Lutheran Social Services of the Southwest, as well as Nevada, Spirit in the Desert, and Advocacy in both Arizona and Nevada. Because of your generosity, we also get to walk with seminary students, like intern Jen Smith. And by the way, thank you for being a teaching congregation and hosting her, and 20 others like her in the Grand Canyon Synod. We also get to support the work of the Navajo Evangelical Lutheran Mission. And that's not all. Walking together, which is also called accompaniment, happens in many ways as your gifts are added to the other 88 congregations in the Grand Canyon Synod. For example, we invest in schools and education and churches in our Companion Synod, Senegal. Last year, a group of students from Senegal had an exchange with students from Grand Canyon Synod. These young people got a chance to learn from each other about new cultures and opportunities. Our Grand Canyon Synod young people learned how you proclaim Jesus in a Muslim majority peaceful country. It was eye-opening for all of them. Your gifts also support the Lutheran Episcopal Ministry Cruzando Fronteras. It's in Sonora, and it provides meals in a safe place for asylum seekers as they wait for their interviews. You know, COVID happened and we were all sent home, but the Synod kept finding ways to walk together. 
over 400 deacons and pastors and lay leaders like you participated in stewardship conversations, online learnings about worship and technology, open conversations on race. Your financial support means that nothing stops the work to which we've been called to proclaim Jesus Christ in word and deed, not even a pandemic. We continue to be church together, better together for the sake of the gospel. So thank you, Christ the Lord, for the ways in which you partner to communicate Jesus, connect people, and create possibilities. Well, thank you very much for that. Now, as we prepare ourselves for worship, I remind you that uh, of who's, uh, who's who in the service. We're delighted today to have Ron Bonstetter uh, back with us, offering a prelude in Native American flute. Uh, Jan Meyer Thompson will be present with us doing a piano solo, and of course, our own Lincoln Wright uh, will be offering the organ post -lude. With that, I invite you to take this time now during the prelude and prepare yourselves for worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates, redeems, and sustains us and all of creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are active to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from a loving embrace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble, cast away our transgressions, and turn us again to the light of you, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God hears the cries of all who call out in need, and through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. Amen.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And I'll be with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Let us pray. Sovereign God, raise your throne in our hearts. Created by you, let us live in your image. Created for you, let us act for your glory. Redeemed by you, let us give you what is yours. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Thessalonians, the first chapter. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that he has chosen you. Because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of persons we prove to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy, inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. 
For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak about it. For the people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless the name of the Lord. Proclaim God's salvation. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap Jesus in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with the truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then Jesus said to them, Whose head is on this? And whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I know two people who have been good friends for a very long time. They enjoy each other's company. They have traveled together. They share common interests, and they genuinely care about each other's lives. But they find themselves on opposite ends of the political spectrum, to the extreme, nothing in common in that area at all. For a time, it became the habit of one to try and trap the other in her words, as the writer of Matthew puts it in our lesson today, as an attempt to draw the other into a political discussion which always ended badly. So finally, the other says, this must stop. 
So they more or less agreed not to discuss politics until such time as they could find more areas of agreement. And they don't. And they remain friends. But both feel that their friendship is somehow less because of it. Whether it's politics or something else in general, or whether it is some specific topic, we each probably have been in a similar situation in which those who are against us attempt or even succeed in trapping us into a conversation. Now, some of us may be better than others at seeing what is about to happen and avoiding the trap. Jesus spots it right away. And as he often does in his replies, he replies with a question of his own. What's in your wallet? (laughs) With that question, what's in your pocket? Show me the coin. Jesus drives home the truth of his accusation that they are hypocrites. Because the law that the Pharisees so vigorously apply to sinners, to those whom they consider sinners, also says that a Jew should not carry anything which bears a graven image. The Jews had separate coinage for that reason. But the truth be told, Outside of the temple, Jewish coinage was pretty much worthless. And if you were going to buy anything at the local Roman market, you had to have Roman coins. So the Pharisees' words say, keep every jot and tittle of the law. But their actions say, I do what I have to do to survive. Law be damned. Now, if we're honest, I think all of us are more like the Pharisees than we would like to admit. It's a dilemma that we all face. Sincerely believing one thing and finding ourselves doing another. This is a part of the human condition. Christians call it sin. But I think that the beginning of the path towards repentance, towards turning ourselves increasingly away from such behavior, lies in Jesus' question, whose image is this? And whose inscription? I'm disappointed in our Revised Standard Version of Scriptures today, which translates it, whose head? Most translators go with the word image, or some with the word likeness, or even the word picture, all of which do a better job of drawing us back to the story of creation, where we are told that all human creatures are created in the image, the likeness, of God. Whose image is this? In the first letter to the Thessalonians, it mentions that the people at Thessalonica became imitators of Paul, Silas, and Timothy, and imitators of the Lord. The notion of imitating Christ is an important part of Paul's theology. In many ways, the image which the world should see when they look at the church and when they look at Christians is Christ. Whose image is this? If we are sincere in our desire to be disciples of Jesus Christ, the answer when we look in the mirror in the morning or when others look at us, should be Jesus Christ. Now, today, we are just a couple of weeks out from an election, which seems existential. Regardless of where we stand politically, it feels like everything we care about is on the ballot. As a nation, We are divided, anguished, bruised, and broken. Some of us have lost our ability to extend grace or generosity to people whose views differ from our own. Some of us have become so jaded, so hardened, so cynical, that we cannot even afford to feel, to feel what it is which is churning beneath the surface. Whose image? is this. 
I have Christian friends, family members, and parishioners who hold radically different political views than I do, and to whom I owe every bit of love, respect, and faithfulness which I can muster, apart from all the politics. So I'm struggling to find a way forward, struggling to do what Jesus asks of me in this week's gospel lesson. Give to the emperor the things which are the emperor's and give to God the things which are God's. On its face, this passage from Matthew's gospel is about taxation. We know from history that the trick of it is that the Pharisees of Jesus' day saw the tribute tax as heretical and anti-nationalist and a capitulation to the pagan empire, while the Herodians, the politicians, viewed refusing to pay the tax as sedition. It seems inescapable, I guess, that politics and faith mix at some point. Jesus understands the problem, and he offers the Pharisees and the Herodians an ambiguous both-and kind of solution. Give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and give to God the things that are God's. How typical of Jesus, not only to respond to a challenge with an even greater challenge, but to insist that the relationship between faith and politics is too complex to reduce to any simple platitude. Now, it's important to stop here and note what Jesus does not say. Jesus does not say that there are two distinct realms, the religious and the secular, and that they each require our equal fidelity. What he says is far more subtle and far more complicated. The coin is already the emperor's. There's his face stamped right there on it. So give it to him. But then consider the much harder question. What belongs to God? What kind of tribute do we owe God? As I said before, Jesus means to draw us back to the opening chapters of Genesis where we have learned that as human beings, we are created by God and we bear God's image in the world. God's likeness is stamped into us and upon us. God's signature is written across our very beings. Which means, if we keep this analogy going, that we owe God everything. Our whole and our entire selves. All of it. Any fantasy we might harbor of dividing up the secular and the sacred is simply that, a fantasy. We cannot separate Caesar's realm from God's realm when everything, everything, belongs to God. But what does that mean? What does that mean to give God what belongs to God? Especially in these hard and divisive days. How do we bear forth God's image while our families, our communities, our churches splinter? over political and cultural differences that seem somehow unbridgeable. How do we live into that all-encompassing reign of God? While a scorched earth, ideology-driven, the ends justifies the means divisiveness reigns within American Christendom. The thing is, when I read the Gospels, I don't see a Jesus who cares more about the ends than the means. If anything, he gives special place to the means. The one who calls himself the way understands 
that the way we go about achieving our goals, the language we use or abuse, the stories we lift up or silence, the people we protect or oppress, the sins we confess or indulge, the truths we proclaim or deny, these all make a difference in the world. As Christum Christians, we don't have the, op the option of fudging on the love and mercy of God for some greater political result. We cannot isolate our political choices and our actions as if they do not reflect who we are as image bearers of Christ. If everything belongs to God, then our spiritual lives, our political lives, must cohere somehow. They must not contradict each other. Which is to say, what is technically legal isn't always compassionate. What is politically expedient isn't always just, merciful, righteous, or life-giving. Our political leaders are not our gods. Our rendering unto Caesar must always take second place to what we render unto God. So when I look to Jesus to think about how to practice my faith in the political realm, I see no path to glory that sidesteps humility, surrender, and sacrificial love. I see no permission to secure my personal prosperity at the expense of another person's suffering. I see no evidence that truth-telling is optional. I see no kingdom that favors the contemptuous over the brokenhearted, and no church that thrives for long when it aligns itself with power. Christians must have the heart and the faith to listen to our opponents with genuine curiosity and compassion. As an image bearer of a loving, forgiving, and gracious God, maybe I owe to God in this hour the very grace and the very generosity which he extends to me and to all of us. Figuring out my taxes is the easy part. What is much harder is living out my political convictions with a Christ-like humility, with a compassion that embraces my political other as a sister or a brother. But if I really belong to God, if I really am fashioned in God's image, then I need to practice my faith and my politics in ways which reflect who God is. It's not a question of backing down or being dishonest or watering down my beliefs. It's a question of remembering that God, whose image I bear, is the God of endless and sacrificial love. It's not a reflection of Christ's image to berate another who is created in God's image for their political views, for their mistakes, or for what we may even perceive as their unchristian behavior or choices. The question isn't whose image do they bear, but the question is whose image do I bear? Not what is in their pocket, but what is in my pocket. What's in your wallet? Yes, by all means, give the emperor what belongs to the emperor. But remember that our first loyalty is to a kingdom that will remain long after all earthly empires have risen and fallen. Caesar's realm is limited and temporary. God's reign is eternal and it is all-encompassing. Give to God what is God's. In short, give God 
everything. Amen. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With confidence in God's grace and mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Gracious God, you call us by name and invite us to share your good news. Send your Holy Spirit among preachers, missionaries, and evangelists. We give thanks for the witness of your servant Luke, the evangelist, whom the church commemorates today. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of praise, the heavens and all creation declare your salvation. From the rising of the sun to its setting, may the whole universe show forth your goodness. Raise up devoted stewards of all that you have made. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all, may your word of justice sound forth in every place. Restore divided nations and communities with reconciling truth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of light, we pray for those living with pain, illness, isolation, grief, anger, or doubt. Especially Kim and Marshall, Jackie, Katie, George, Sherry, Jaron, Rod, Tony, Patsy, Julia, Mary Lou, Mark, Barb and Dave, Stacy, Tracy, Dave, Terry, Tim, Sherry, Marilyn, Scott, Susan, George, Daniel Pete and the 33rd IBCT, Donna, Glenn, John and Cheryl, Jory and Lester, Mike, Julie, Ryan and Connor, Ron, Joel, Nan, Marsha, Rick, Kathy, Laura, Kirsten, Joe, Sandy, Ellen, Randy, Paul, Umberto, Tom, Karen, Debbie. For Ellen, John, Larry, Lana, Monica, Cam, Joel, Mark, Joel, Jeff, Ken, Ollie, Hilaro, Stephanie, Brett, Jean, Donna, Jean, and Ruth. Join their voices in a new song, assuring them that you call them each by name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of truth, you show no partiality. May your spirit guide the work of justices, magistrates, court officials, and all vocations of the law, that your promise of restoration may be known. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Listen as we call on you, O God, and enfold in your loving arms all for whom we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. You have sent before us these gifts of your good creation. Prepare us for your heavenly banquet. Nourish us with this rich food and drink, and send us forth to set tables in the midst of the suffering world. Through the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. He is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty, and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread, 
and drink of this cup. We remember the Lord's death until he comes again. our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The table is prepared. Come and eat. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen us and keep us in his grace this day and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, gracious God, that you have once again fed us with food beyond compare, the body and blood of Christ. Lead us from this place, nourished and forgiven, in the your beloved of vineyard, to wipe away the tears of all hunger and thirst. Guided by the example of the same Jesus Christ, and led by the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Mother of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you and lead you into the way of truth and life.
Go in peace and serve the poor. Thanks be to God.